Thank you so much for being here. And and before we go into uh, there's so many strands to tonight's conversation. I'll try and kind of keep them keep them tight. But how has the pandemic itself uh, upturned or affected the world of art and music in your estimation? Well, thank you, Pyle. It's, it's good to be back, uh, though in virtual mode. Uh, thank you for inviting me once again to Algebra. Uh, very bluntly put, the uh, situation for uh, the world of art is quite dire. Uh, it's very bad, and uh, I think it's something that many of us realize the moment the idea of the lockdown was even thought about. Um, what we don't realize is in the case of especially performing arts, uh, the space of performance are social, um, public, or religious. You know, there's a lot of this you know, cross-cultural and cross-geographical uh, happenings. Artists move, and only if they move is, is actually an occupation happening. Now, everything just went poof overnight. Now, we also have this imagery of artists. You know, they, we, we have two imageries. One imagery is one of the artists who is comfortable, you know, the, the Bollywood framework or the classical music framework, you know, where you see our faces in the media, etc. The other framework is an exotic framework, right, where you have these uh, rare art forms from Meghalaya or Tripura or, you know, or this, this painting of some village. So both are very problematic frameworks because the reality is for most artists in this country, across the world, Art is an everyday livelihood happening. Now, what they make on that evening's performance, the few hundred or the few thousand rupees, is what is going to save them. Secondly, a lot of art is also seasonal. So if you have, say, temple festivals around a certain time or religious functions, you have three, four months of a lot of hectic activity, traveling from town to town, village to village, and then everything is over. There's nothing. So they also do, they double up as people, you know, agriculturalists or even laborers. So now everything went absolutely dead overnight and what we have discovered you know through because we, we have been doing some work for the last six months for artists in India is that there is actually not very much difference between the migrant uh, worker and and the artist it's pretty much the same scenario the situation is dire and what we don't realize also is if everything else comes back to so-called some semblance of normalcy you're not going to be still allowing people to gather so until, until 2021, I don't really see any hope. And we're also talking about people in the fringes of the film world, the light people, you know, the sound people. And, it's, 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 and, and one important thing is most art in the world is niche. We have to, I think I've drilled this again every time I say it, because the two big monsters of art, of cinema more, uh, and, and say popular music, are exceptions to how the world of art exists, which is in local, geographical, festivals specific niche markets. Today, this doesn't exist. That uh, is, in fact, it is, it, not only it's, does it sound dire, it doesn't sound like it will go anywhere, but also, um, I think this is a great starting point to say, how do we break that idea of art, let alone as a luxury, but to, to um, you know, and we've seen this, one of the problems uh, and journalism and media in India, one of the things is that when you don't want to pay for something, yeah. Um, you know, that becomes part of the problem. And I think art uh, has historically, but particularly what you call the more niche forms of art, suffer from our refusal to treat them as something we should be paying well for as a priority rather than as a luxury, you know. And, and what is done to kind of rescue art from this uh, kind of chamber of you know, isolation? You know, one of the fundamental things is we are a country of hypocrites. Uh, is, you know, we keep talking about this being country of diverse culture, art, language, blah, 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 you know. And the fact of the matter is, uh, it's never, we don't consider art as a necessary aspect of our social living. We don't consider this an everyday thing, that even that little song that you hum or that, or the, or the recognition of colors, recognition of movement is an integral part of the human being of civilizational living, of sharing, of, of, you know, inhabiting similar backgrounds or recognizing diversity. Art is at the absolute juncture of creating uh, social conversations. We have never as an independent country recognized this. This is across governments, across everybody. The fact is we have thought of art as utilitarian. We have thought of art as a luxury. We have thought of art as exotic. We have thought of art as a way of, you know, um, 
showing us off to the rest of the world. But actually in everyday living, that we don't attach value. For example, no, when somebody creates a, I sing a song, right? Now, how is that, how, is that, how do you value that? We don't even have, we don't even believe it needs to be valued because we don't see something that's a transactional happening in that sense, right? So therefore, there has to be a complete rewiring of how we perceive culture and art in the society because then we will prioritize its uh, nurturing it and developing it as multiple voices within our respective societies. Look at Europe. I mean, it's a very good example of how it's very important for the state, for the government, for structures to consider it important that libraries, that local songs, local art forms at a district level. We don't have district hubs of cultures, you know, and then you can imagine, Pyle, if you're a marginalized community, if the marginalization of this is even further, right? So until we change this, you know, and this needs great amount of social uh, empowerment and social conversations that it's a necessity art is necessity to social living and it is not an add-on it's not a padded and you know i'm tone deaf let's stop talking about all these things whether you're tone deaf or not music as a social being is fundamental for our well-being as a nation i think uh, we have to think of it in, in this kind of rewiring is essential and and no government has done us uh, any good in the way they think is giving grants and giving sponsorships is a way to go ahead. And, and I'm going to invert the sequence of, I thought I'd come to basically talking of uh, music in general towards the latter part after we speak of the book, but since that's where we've begun. Um, what is your relationship to music? And I, I, the reason I ask is when you say the, the idea of what happens when you perform, what happens when I hear a song, what, is, uh, what does music do that nothing else does? you and you think in a society well i can talk of music because that's my channel that's my pathway i'm sure somebody will have some other pathway so uh, this is probably applicable to any other <coughs> um, correlated uh, experiences uh, you know what does art to do i mean why did the if, let's first understand that art is is one of the most incredible creations of humanity i mean i mean art didn't happen by itself Art was created by the species, by the, by, the, by the human species. Isn't that magnificent? That we thought of different ways of cajoling, of triggering, of, you know, inspiring our emotional being. And our emotional being is so diverse. So why did we do it? it it's not just, you know, you could say initially art started as a way of record. Okay, the cave, caveman went, uh, hunted, he wanted to know where the, where the animals are found, he recorded it on, say, the wall. But just look at how he recorded it. He recorded it in a fashion that was interpretative of his experience. Now, that's the magic of art. Magic of art is takes the literal, the literal is what he saw, or what she saw, or what happened, right? But the non-literal is the experience of that interaction. Now, that's what the cave person drew on that wall is that interaction and the possibility. And so very quickly, I think we as a species realize that there is an emotional uh, depth to us that allow us to ex allows us to retain, reimagine and recreate everything that's around and within. And we did that through tone, through music, through dance, through movement, through stillness, through plastic arts. And all this together gives you the possibility of experiencing life not just as something about yourself, but that's something much larger and encompassing of the entire idea of living. So even, even shall we say that that microcosm art experience you will find in a little village specific to a geographical location is actually an, um, a symbol of the larger idea of living in an experience if you're going to extrapolate it. Isn't that magic? And that's what art is. And if you don't think that's necessary to life, I think we should all be dead. You uh, and and you actually do not come from musical lineage, uh, even though you mentioned your mother used to sing. But she's not a performer, and um, I come from a capitalist lineage. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you'd been able to bring some of that into putting into my mind. <laughs> what was was there a moment? I know we look for these kind of transcendental moments, but was there a moment of recognition or realization? that uh, music was where, you know, this was at for you, like as a, as a, as a life vision. 
you know, not really. I wanted to be an economist. That was my big dream in school. You know, um, still a subject I, I I love, and I still. I find battling with, uh, and and it seems to say that the idea of waking up in the morning and saying I'd love to be an economist. <laughs> When I when I told um, uh, Amartya Sen this, he said, "Thank God you didn't." So, <laughs> so uh, yeah, so um, that's what I wanted to be. I mean, I loved singing. There's one thing I right from a child. I knew my, my my parents tell me, my friends, my relatives tell me is I never. You asked me to sing, I would belt it out. That's it. You know, I was really that's something I loved, and I did. I never thought I'll be a musician. It's only when I was about, I think. Um, Early, t- you know, about 13 or 14, when uh, colleagues and younger musicians around me said, "I think you should take this seriously, and this is a possible future for you." Um, I didn't. I mean, I didn't really think. I think there's no moment. I think I, when when I got recognition from colleagues and from peers saying that, you know, this is something you should really think about seriously, is when I switched from um, uh, BA economics, which I completed. Uh, and i said you know i need to uh, think about this as my full time because i loved it i just loved singing i loved spending hours singing all night it's just something that i just loved um, i didn't think of the many other things around it but just the act of singing was um, something that's overwhelmed me always until today um when we when we speak when you were speaking earlier of uh, of mus- music being as that way one of the ways among the arts in which you kind of transcend your own experience you transcend that that world of magic but music uh, or the arts in general occupy that strange place where on the one hand they consider transcendental they break boundaries you know boundaries of nation and so on and yet cultural identity becomes such a tool to draw barriers to draw boundaries um so how do you think um music but also listeners kind of can come to navigate that place where the same music represents boundary and freedom well that's that's the whole trap isn't it that that at at one at one part it is this liberating possibility but it is the same construction that also constricting right and that's that's the tough one to navigate whether you're a listener uh, or not or whether you're a performer or a singer uh, the thing that you know and the other hard thing is ideas of beauty let's just let's just go back to this notion of beauty you know what do i find beautiful uh, many times that's one of the toughest areas uh, to navigate in art because a lot of social discrimination actually begins from ideas of beauty if you're just willing to dig a little deeper uh, because uh, right from how we perceive a person the way they look the clothes that they wear even the way we already have framed so many things now imagine us doing that in an abstract notion of sound how difficult is it to even explain it to somebody you know if i tell somebody your idea of sophistication is limited that art form you're listening to and cannot be carried to another world because you are not part of that world they will fight it tooth and nail say i agree with all your social discourse but there is something more complex about classical hindustani khayal compared to what some villager sings in a village isn't there and i'm trying to say no there are two different frameworks of experience so it's a very hard one to navigate but i think i that's why i like to get into this idea of beauty because judgment is we are as a species shall we say designed to first pattern recognize and judge so we recognize something based on what we know which is very normal and then we already placed it in in different categories like don't like uh, far away uh, distinct alien blah 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 if we know more information about the source of its coming then the categorization is clearer right so if i know more information of the individuals or the community that's practicing it i add layers of so called aesthetic commentary which are actually non aesthetic commentary already on the art form now this is happening in a very subconscious automated fashion now what i'm demanding is a subversion of that automation and if you look at it isn't that what democracy demands of us also right it demands that we subvert our natural instinct to control oppress preconceive And so you know the idea of equality or the idea of equity is an idea that challenges our very nature and that's exactly what you need to do when you have ideas of beauty ideas of of complexity sophistication i mean it's very similar to people thinking that uh, that uh, sciences are more more uh, intellectual and require far rigorous hard work compared to the lighter art sections of colleges we still believe it in this country you do math you're smarter they won't tell you but they will feel it and and smile when you said i if you said you're a phd in math 
compared to, say, your PhD in literature, we know what we're going to value more, aren't we? So is it all this coming? So I'm just trying to give, give parallels for us to recognize. So it's a tough one. All I will request is this. Can we start from a point of saying, we don't know? Maybe that's a good beginning, right? To say, you know, I don't know. Let me try and say, I don't know. Uh, because th that's a good way to respect. So I think when you say, I don't know, you're first placing yourself at a level that is lower than that you normally would. Secondly, you're offering respect and trying to learn. This allows us a pathway, a kind of a road to experience things that we consider, shall we say, not part of what is high culture within courts or not part of what is um, complex and sophisticated culture in a completely new world. I think there's, this, is, this is a world filled with diversity and sophistication and complexity. And it's also, I'm, and this, the irony of what we constantly say in, this, in, the, in, this, in the uppity world, that simplicity is the hardest thing to find. But when we find the simple music, we say, oh, that's too simple, not as sophisticated as what I enjoy. Isn't that an irony? No, and, and I, I just wanted to, well, you know, when you speak of, of course, notions of beauty and aesthetics, and um, the, somewhere the idea of personal taste has come also to be abused as a justification for pretty much anything. And really, I wanted to ask, because while we do expect rigor from uh, the artist, the performer, uh, what do you think is the responsibility of the listener? How do you teach yourself to listen better? Well... Um, you know, um, I'll give you an example that I often use in uh, conversations and it's from a, from a classroom experience. And uh, so when I, when, I, when I teach a student, I'm sitting there with the student trying to teach him or her a line of music. And we're going at it for 15 minutes, 20 minutes and um, he's making the same mistake again and again and again. And I go, no, that's not it. This is it. I recognize it for a second and then I said, repeat, it's gone. Uh, it took me a while to realize why it was happening. It was happening because when I was singing, the student is already singing in his head, right? He's already preempting. I start a line and the lion has already started to sing in its head. So the question is, who is he listening to? Is he listening to me or is he listening to himself? Now, I think that's a great starting point for the audience is that what you already know is usually also a limiting factor. As much as it is an enabling accessing factor, it is also a limiting factor. So if you can say, if you can listen in a, in a manner that is not a sing-along, because when you sing along, you're listening to yourself, but actually receive. So hearing and listening, is that's the difference. And that's also true of conversations we have in society today between most of us, right? We are already completing the, the sentence before it is completed. We already, we've already answered the question before it is asked. So maybe that's a great way a listener of music can start and say, you know, I'm just going to receive. I'm not going to be sing along. I'm not going to, I'm not going to already know. Because then the judgment reduces. Right? And then the discrimination is also, then you see, I mean, music and art in general, not just music, even painting or anything, can be a great avenue for communication, for understanding. But for that, we need to take that step. We need to take that step, especially when we come from privilege, any kind of privilege. We need to take that step of saying, you know, I want to shut myself out from all that I have baggaged and, and I find uh, problematic and I, I'm discriminative, whatever, you know, and say, I'm going to enter a new space. I'm going to listen, completely aware. Then some, you know, even if you can, do, you can't always do it, even if you can do it for, say, a few minutes, I can tell you that it opens a new world and, and there's an example I'll give you. You know, uh, one of the art forms that we work, we've worked a lot with is called Kut in Tamil Nadu and it's, it's or Parai, there are many art forms, but um, I remember when I first listened to many of these art forms, um, I found them interesting within quotes, what, you know, what that means. Um, but, you know, the moment I, after almost a year of multiple listenings and multiple exchanges, when I even accidentally entered that space, forgetting everything that I know as a musician, as sound, as, as tune, the whole experience changed. I can tell you, even the idea of what is in tune is diverse. You know, many people tell you Bob Dylan is not in tune. He's speaking half the time. No, but his music is beautiful. So you enter his domain 
his idea of beauty, his idea of sound, his idea of pitch, to be able to listen to his, uh, Dylan. If you want to listen to uh, other uh, music, the Manganiyas, you need to understand, get into their space of music. So I think that's, that's the kind of, this is the surrender that we should talk about, not, not the other forms of surrender that we waste our time on. So we'll, uh, we'll come to the book, but a question, because you, you mentioned uh, teaching and students, and you've been, taking, <coughs> you've been hosting, I think, last month, workshops uh, online. Um, and I was interested to see that the descriptor said a fearless and serious engagement in music. The word fearless in there uh, is loaded. Right? What is the fear usually attached to in this engagement? Um, in, and in this context, what would fearless represent? What would you ask the student to be fearless about? Well, I mean, it was, uh, it was a series of master classes. It's the first time I did it. Actually, my students are the ones who convinced me to do it. So we did um, 12 sessions. Uh, it was a closed room master class session, and we had, we had two batches. So we had about 60 people from across the world who signed up. So it was uh, incredible. It was each session. It was three hours each session. Suppose we an hour and a half, but it was three hours. And it was what, what we had done is I curated in a fashion that they discussed the hardcore nitty gritty of singing and you know the technique etc but they discussed all the politics in so they discussed gender you discuss caste you discuss form you discuss society you discuss the notions of folk and classical and what we are discussing now you know how does one listen in an open manner uh, all this was part of it uh, part of the curation and it was intentionally done because i feel this intersection is entirely missing both in in the social discourse and in the aesthetic discourse um, fearless was a very important word because I don't think that word is something we naturally, you know, people will quote and say, I read this in the Upanishads, it said that, you know, teachers and students, okay, I agree, everything in the text is true, but let's look at reality and see how we've been trained as societies. You know, we are scared to ask questions. We are scared to ask certain questions. We know which are the questions that will be acceptable and make me sound intelligent and which are the questions that I will not do because it disturbs the fundamental fabric of what is being talked about. So this whole idea of fearlessness is to say, I can ask anything I want. You know, I can challenge the teacher. The hierarchy of the teacher itself needs to be challenged. That's what we did in that session, I'm quite happy to say, uh, because ideas were challenged. Uh, what I said was challenged. There were arguments. So if you think of me more as somebody who just spent more time in something and um, is sharing, of course, I have a huge ego, but we'll keep that aside for now. But, uh, but just as the possibility that you can debate. And so the, the idea of fearlessness is not something that we naturally hold in the idea of learning. That's true. Let's, let's agree whether it's our school education, uh, whether it's our university education. Let's not forget most of this country, people do get beatings with a scale, even today. Uh, let's not forget that um, students are still told to shut up if they ask a question that's considered necessary. You know, and it's not just in it's a university, it's everywhere. And imagine the world of so-called classical arts. It's sacrosanct, it's divine, you can't ask a question, you can't, you can't ask certain things, you can't question the parampara, you know, you can't ask questions of saying, isn't, your, isn't what your guru saying wrong? You know, you can't ask these questions, right? It's almost defied, uh, everybody's placed on a pedestal. The idea was, can we challenge all this and forget about it and say, you know, no. Um, say that, let's just, let's just start on a, on, a, on a kind of, at least uh, a tight, held rope where everybody is tugging in their own little way and then that becomes a space that's fearless and that's fearless for everyone. I must tell you what is unbelievable in that whole session and you know I was kind of nervous about the Zoom platform you know I'm not much of a virtual person um, but something really magical happened. It became a very safe space for very important conversations, uh, challenges, discussions on gender, on sexuality, on caste, on, on rendition, on sound. It was uh, quite amazing um, how a group of 30 to 60 people who don't know each other at all over a period of two weeks uh, were able to have such open discussions and it gave me a lot of hope that, you know, that the more we carry on beyond the social media platform, I think we can do far more good. So uh, to, to come to the book, because a lot of the themes that you mentioned are in fact uh, also the, the <clears throat> um, what triggered the exploration um, that took four years of your life um, and, and uh, your writing now is as sustained as your music. You know, it's not 
uh, I wrote one book or I wrote a, yeah, it is really part of your journey uh, yeah. that you also write. So uh, what does the writing do and why did you devote four years to this book? You know, I never thought I would write. My English teacher still laughs at me. So, <laughs> so uh, she, she's still shocked. She said, TM, you actually write pretty well. And I'm shocked. I said, oh, thank you very much. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, uh, writing happened totally accidentally. I mean, the first piece I wrote was, uh, I just saw it a couple of days ago doing some spring cleaning. It was 1999 when I got upset with a, uh, with a piece written in the Hindu newspaper. And I wrote a response. I think that's the first time I published anything in my life. Uh, but um, as far as this book goes, I think it was, it, it's part of a journey of, uh, of kind of asking the big questions of my own identity, uh, right? And definitely caste and gender are very big parts of uh, how I see my social engagement uh, and how I see my own involvement in what you could call philosophical and social conversations and discussions. And I realized that, you know, the, when I wrote a Southern Music, the Carnatic Story in, in 2013, uh, it, it dealt with, it was, a, it was just about the musical form, it was historical, it had musicological uh, investigation, it also had a social conversation on the whole play of caste within the Carnatic uh, fold. And, you know, I realized uh, about a year, I think it was a year after sometime, when I realized that, you know, that my whole uh, canvas of caste within Carnatic music was only limited to the people who sit on stage or people who sit on opposite me in the audience. So there was no other, there was no other frame. There was nobody else existent. And that's what hit me. And I said uh, that that's so problematic because I know instrument makers, you know, uh, what about them? And I especially know Murdanga makers uh, because, um, you know, unlike making other instruments, say, uh, ta you know, Tanpura, you make a veena, you make a violin, the difference is the Murdangam needs a constant interaction between the player and the maker. That's not required in a, in a Tanpura or, you know, in a Tanpura, I buy a Tanpura after one, I'm changing the strings. I may require help at some point of time, but that's very minor, right? But in, in a, I, you know, instrument like a tabla or a murdangam or a pakhavaj, you know, there's a constant change of membrane. There is, you know, you have to change that black spot. So there is actually a social interaction between these two individuals. And the other thing is that the two individuals belong to very different sections of society as far as caste goes. Most murdangam makers are Dalits, many Dalit Christians. Um, the murdangam player is 99.9% .9 a Brahmin. So, I mean, th that's such a very interesting uh, juncture of meeting and something that I, I felt that I, I need to explore and that was also a place for my learning because it was something that was absent from my own discourse, right? So that's how it began and uh, I didn't even know what form the book would take. I had no clue. I just started uh, meeting um, great makers and uh, interviewing them and the book just kind of uh, came from it. So there's two uh, aspects to this, which uh, the first one that I want to come to is when politics is touched and, and you put it in that kind of context before of um, the Mridangam itself as an instrument involves hide, it involves cow hide, it involves buffalo hide, goat hide, all of it, uh, played as you said by the Brahmin, made most often by the Dalit or almost exclusively by the Dalit, um, prayed to by the Brahmin. Uh, right, who will otherwise, uh, you know, sanctify the cow, but uh, but uh, kind of will kill over its killing. Yeah. And will again, venerate the instrument made out of that. Yeah. Strength. The ironies in that, the hypocrisies in that yeah. are many. How did you? Um, what is the rationalization that you have found uh, that that performers or artists allow themselves <laughs> to make to perpetuate this? You know, that's the whole thing, how we, uh, we behave as species, you know, especially when we have power and control uh, is uh, how do we, I mean, like you said, how does one, you know, just logically, how does one reconcile it? You know, you go crazy about, uh, you know, beef, about cow, about praying to the cow. It's uh, most important. There's the same community that's playing it. Forget about playing it. Half the people sitting in the audience are from upper caste communities enjoying the sound of Muratagam and saying that was divine. I mean. Just think of that, right? And what is being beaten is cow hide, buffalo hide, and goat hide. So how does one reconcile it? It's, I think, two, three ways. And I'll, the most 
important is the last but you know uh, like there there be some excuses given like saying that i've heard uh, you know mystical stories saying that the cow actually prays that its hide is going to be should be used for a mridanga so that automatically becomes an act of divinity in some fashion but there is also something else that is done that uh, uh, logically be given that the cow is not killed for the mridangam skin it's any way being killed for meat so that you distance yourself from the act of gore and say that's happening for some other operation and we are just making use of what is available first that's factually wrong because uh, the cow for the skin for the mridangam you can't just call somebody and say just send me cow skin you know it's chosen the cow is chosen so yes the cow come to the um, uh, uh, you know abattoir to be uh, killed but you don't just take any cow so you have the mridangam maker or his assistant going there choosing the cow and the buffalo skin and then that is used so first it is specific in fact it's a very important specificity if you want tonal quality then it's not any species of cow by the way they hate delhi cows they call it delhi cows they'll tell you delhi cows don't bring sound we need not the cow not to means local like right? uh, geographic local cow so it's also specific now the most fascinating thing is when the skin become a part of a divine instrument so that transition is where the distancing happens right so even in vocabulary chains so till a certain point you call it skin in tamil okay after a point it is called tatt now tatt means literally plate but what we are saying is talking about the membrane the circular membrane right so when the tol or skin becomes the plate or the tatt it's moved from become being a part of a cow to becoming an integral sonic body for an instrument and the only person who makes this transition for you is that maker who is sitting right there at the intersection okay who takes who handles the cow the 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 skin the blood the flesh the fat everything cleans all that for you makes it disappear and then trans brings it at the form of a plate and then you say i need this quality skin i need that skin is better there you don't have a problem because the skin has disappeared so in most things that are within courts thought to be pure somebody is doing that operation that allows you to then say it's pure and that's the ugliness of social hierarchy it is usually the person who is completely marginalized in society who is exploited who is allowed who who has who needs to go to the abattoir who needs to spend all that time doing everything so that you can retain your sense of purity i mean there can't be something more uglier than that uh, a mridanga maker told me this he said you know we are in between if we are not there the skin will not become the mridanga if you take us out of the equation but the mridanga will go into the puja room we will not go into the puja room so i mean that's how we do it you know there is an art form called tayyam in kerala uh it's practiced by mainly people from uh, you know dalit communities or other castes that are marginalized when they wear that whole attire and you know get into a trance it's a kind of a ritual uh, religious art form uh they are worshiped by everybody they are performing in upper caste homes and upper, upper caste areas the moment they take out that whole cloak of uh identity of the cloak identity they are again disregarded as margin society that's how we retain this ugly notion of purity and caste um you know and, and this actually um it, it is said when particularly caste scholars uh will often speak of caste being worn physically on the body at the uh, again the dichotomy of it being invisible right so one of the ways it is perpetuated is it is not visible but when we say worn on the body it's exactly this the the tactile job that only the lower caste will do the physical costume that only um, you know you that becomes your root to either yeah. trans or turning um what is the relationship uh, of the body uh, both for the performer as well as for the maker who oh, it's it's very um, you know that's it's also a question of knowledge in some fashion right and how do we how do we how do you perceive knowledge knowledge systems or knowledge ideas that come from the idea of the physical 
uh, work of the body. We do that hierarchy even in our, within art performances. So certain art forms that are marginalized are considered, in fact, labor. They call it labor. If you ask them what they're doing, they'll say that it's labor. I would never call my singing labor. It, I would always call it something divine, right? So it is also this whole idea of the body is also bo idea of knowledge. Where as much as more and more we dissociate an act from the body, we elevate it to an intellectual frame of knowledge. That's fundamentally also a discriminative process and you find it intertwined or shall we say um, trapped within social discrimination, whether it's race, color, gender or caste, you know, for that matter. The same thing is happening. Now, if you look at the maker, you know, and, and the, I mean, I've said in the book, the first person who actually makes, who creates sound out of that instrument is the maker. It's not the player, you know, the first person who knows what that beautiful sound is and what needs to be adjusted is the maker, not the player, right? Now, um, the whole process of making the Murdangam is a very physical process. It's extremely physical. It, it requires travel, it requires access to material, and it requires a lot of physical strength to know. And it's, you know, it's a lot of thing is felt experience, felt knowledge. Uh, the maker touches a piece of skin, the maker knows whether it's going to bring good sound or not, or he's experimenting, you know, and a lot of experimentation. And all this is not documented in a written form, but it's all known within the making community, right? Now, that's the kind of knowledge we're talking about. Then you have the knowledge of performance, which comes, especially in the world of, I keep saying so-called classical, it comes from the idea of uh, both the oral tradition and a certain idea of intellectual theorization, structurization, that we place as falsely being exclusive to these art forms. And I say falsely. Now, now in the intersection of the two is where the Mildangam comes into being, right? Between the idea of that is coming from uh, a non-documented, -docu marginalized notion of knowledge and the body to a very documented, upper-held, caste uh, privilege. Now, the interesting thing is some of the responses I've got post this, this book. One of the biggest problems people have had is they said, why, how, why are you equalizing the making with the playing? It's fascinating that that, that question has been raised. Nobody until today has asked me, why, why have you not spoken about the maker, right? Nobody bothered. The moment a knowledge system was challenging the idea of knowledge, or the book fundamentally said this is extremely complex, beautiful making. It did not say it is the same or equivalent anywhere in the book. But the perception that this is being elevated as a very important intellectual act itself problematizes the privileged world of saying whatever said and done, the playing is far more, imp uh, far more important. The playing is far more difficult. So do not equalize the knowledge systems or do not make them contest each other. Now that's the answer for your question of the, the body. So how much this disturbs uh, you know, our perception? And you know, immediately people say, you know, what about Stradivarius? You know, I've heard people saying that, you know, making the Murdangam is not so difficult. It's not like making a violin. These makers are not like Stradivarius who made the violin. I mean, Strad I mean, it's, it's, it's shocking that you have these statements because you have not been, you're not sat with the maker uh, to actually make the instrument. One, you don't realize that it all comes. The most interesting thing is all this also is happening within an exchange between the two bodies, between the player and the maker, whether it's the violin, whether it's the mridangam, whether it's anything. There is also that intersection that is happening and there is this conversation and this uh, learning that is happening and also uh, intellection in the makers. So, you know, to see this as an equal exchange, okay, is creates a big problem in social hierarchy because they think the physical cannot be equated with the, the one that is associated only with the mind. Um, so two, two aspects of that. One is, when, again, when you spoke of vocabularies, uh, you know, language and vocabulary yeah. reflecting this, uh, your choice of the word maker in the book rather than artist and artisan because that's a that's a traditional uh, contestation that already exists in society you know is, uh, is the artisan represents craft and this represents yeah so the choice of the word maker uh, why did that to you answer this or was it in response to kind of that tension um, yeah. it was actually a response to something else so generally if you go and ask a Mridhanam player he will call the maker the repairer. It's fascinating. 
all the makers are called repairers okay so i found that most intriguing that it's as if the mridangam comes by itself and this guy is only a, like a, he has a tool kit that kind of adjusts it for you every time right so it was actually a response to that word and i said this is ridiculous you can't call these um, people repairers so i responded to that by saying calling the person maker and i'm glad to say that in the last two months i see the use of the word maker uh, far more used than i have uh, before which is wonderful i mean ultimately the book has made somebody think which is which i'm very happy about so it actually was a response to that but it also is to get away from the trap of you know artisan and artist uh, because i think um, it's a very complicated question i think it's entrenched in social uh, discussions uh, entrenched in perception of say what is a repetitive art act and what is a creative act you know uh, we forget that most of uh, the you know most of uh, what we sing is also a rep repetitive act it's a rearranged act if you think that every time i sing i'm creating something from nowhere it's nonsensical i'm rearranging it in a, in in a way that i'd rearrange it before most of the times that's all i'm doing right so you know what is creative what is new these are all words that need far greater investment of time and thought even even within the artist's world therefore i don't want to get into this you know you could ask this question uh between artisans uh okay you let's look at this you you go to you go to a craft shop right you see two vases with the same motif why do you pick one rather than the other have you ever asked ourselves that question okay uh, most handmade things are not perfect in that sense right in fact that's part of the whole notion that it's made by human so we it is not, so that's not the reason why you pick it it's not that because you saw one was had a clearer flower than the other no but there is something that differentiates the two so it's it's fundamentally not a repetitive act every one is an individual act even if the motif is the same now every time i sing kalyani raga it's an individual act it's the same raga now if we start the conversation there it leads us to very interest interesting territories and then we see that this artist artisan becomes far more complicated uh, an arena to navigate and i like to stay away from it so oh. Uh, you know, we will move soon to audience questions. Although there's a lot else still to talk about, I do want to touch on uh, within the book itself. Uh, you you of course tell very specific human stories uh, of particular makers um, of their families and stuff. But is there any one um, character or person uh, through this process of documentation who intrigued you more than others or who captivated you more than others? there are two people actually and before that i must say one thing it's i must also place on record how problematic it is for a brahmin to be writing this book uh when and discuss sebastian sons if i don't place that it it would, it would be wrong because it is also entrenched in the uh, you have to problematize me as an author of that it's important that the reader also sees that because i also come from privilege and um privilege doesn't go away it stays so in the book you will find many times me ask you know questioning my own privilege i reflecting upon whether i am not able to see something because i am not part of that culture and i come from the baggage of privilege right so you also need to problematize on why does a brahmin need to write this book you know it's okay that needs to be problematized right uh, and wonder whether if the maker had written the book what would the book be like you know i think those are very very important questions that we have to ask ourselves and i have to ask myself as an author um, even though um, i'm part of that endeavor and i'm i'm constantly engaging with that endeavor i am still um, more than a few steps away because of the privileges i i come with that's one now the two characters one is this gentleman called rajamanikam who um, i never met uh, he's i mean he is he is he is such an intriguing character because he is a guy who you know who lived by his own terms and like most makers who pretty much you know shall we say uh, agreed with what uh, the player said or worked within that very oppressive structure found their own freedom found their own spaces within that but never challenged the power structure here is rajamanikam who found his own way of challenging it you know he had rules he said you know i take a siesta in the afternoon you know i i'll sleep a few hours and come and work when i work nobody can disturb me i don't care who you are you are the greatest murdanga play in the world you just have to i mean or tell calling the home and saying you know i uh, telling the wife of the murdanga play saying i want this for lunch today i mean these are all um, a person who's really pushing his social position 
also because he's a master maker and also saying you know i'm as good as as you if you want me this is what you, uh, you you know it's not a question of what you pay me it's also a question of how you see me so demanding respect so he is such an intriguing character that i wish i had met because i would have, i think got a completely different set of answers from him he would have probably challenged said, what the hell are you doing here he would probably told me that you know what's your what's your job here just go sing i mean that's one the other is the woman geeta who um, who is the one of the top suppliers of uh, hide for the mridangam and the madalam in kerala she's just about in her 30s and um, i remember interviewing her i remember forgetting to interview her actually i remember it, her, the village is peruvamba which is just about 30 minutes car ride from palakkad and gone and interviewed her um, uh, i mean her father in law thought of and uh, uh, finished the interview seen the hide in her for uh, in a yard and i was i came back to my hotel a hotel room i called my wife and i said you know this incredible experience and i met this her girl and then she said so you interviewed her and i said no she said why uh well that's a classic um, case of uh, the man forgetting uh, to interview the woman because uh, ultimately i was thinking only as a man and all men make murdagams right so it was my own uh, male chauvinism that was at play and so i went back 20 minutes later Uh, sat with her for an hour and amazing woman i mean it was she was amazing and you know uh, the way she spoke about the making the nuances to how she dries the skin and the amount of pride she had in what she did as being such important work and need was was just incredible i mean uh, she she is a star she is a star that uh, and and means what you think are there how did you feel find that most was there some kind of uniform response in how the makers themselves and what they do have they absorbed a lot of the narrative uh, of uh, where they are in the knowledge hierarchy or do they know differently but they just uh, they're obliged to live by uh, this hierarchy do they know yeah what? i mean i think it depends on who you speak to Uh, so there is some diversity here, but over, uh, you know, if you could ask me an overall observation, um, I'll talk about the Kerala makers likely a little later. But in general, there is a certain acceptance of uh, their position in the making hierarchy. You must, one thing you must understand is that they are very different from, you know, um, the marginalised doing other things in life. Fundamentally, because their cultural space is also this space. just think of this you, you know people always think you know of you know if i say dalit they have this one framework you're you're looking at dalit coming from uh, a dalit activist or listening to dalit narratives which is a narrative of protest and narrative question all that right now this is these are communities that live within the cultural environment of the upper caste it's not just an occupational interaction it's a cultural interaction right so therefore for generations we have to realize that their whole environment is also swallowed by this monster right so um, therefore th- it's much harder to challenge from that position so how do you create for example uh, partnerships within your community to challenge this you can't because your occupation is dependent here too you're culturally also within here so you know being a dalit activist or a person or or a person who is who is strong on these ideas who want to challenge these hierarchies but not within this world is very different from even thinking these things and being part of this world right so it is much harder i think for uh, the makers to to actually challenge it but i would think i also think that through generations things are changing i think that the dravidian politics of tamil nadu has a play as a role to play in this and they themselves accept it that that definitely has a role i think they are in fact interestingly i think they are more connected to the dravidian politics than the multiple uh, dalit movements that have happened in tamil nadu i think that also says something about uh, you know about how they are situated right that's a very that's something i found that they are far more connected with the periyar discourse the mainstream uh, dravidian discourse rather than multiple um, social trans uh, reformers and social commentators questioners and uh, you know political figures from the dalit community itself so it is hard but i think through generations it's changed i think the fact that you know they you know now they don't work as much from the homes of the go to the homes of the maker uh, players to work they work from shops has changed the equation
questions. I think things have changed, but yet they will, um, they will, they will themselves tell you that it's all there underlying always. They all know where the lines are drawn. They all know what, what can be said, what can't be said. So it's still there. The Kerala maker was slightly different. And I think that also got to do with the social uh, uh, you know, uh, design that has evolved in the society of Kerala, where I found uh, the makers in Kerala far more challenged. They challenged my own identity. And they almost looked at me and said, what, what is your job here? By talking to you, what am I going to ever gain? It's a waste of my time. Don't waste my time. That's the first time I was put in my place. Um, uh, we, have a, we have a unique position of audience comments and not questions. So okay. I have a feeling you might want to respond to the first one, which says, Dear TM, I've always followed your career, including what you stand for as an activist. And I've always felt that your intent is right, but perhaps you don't go about it the right way. Um, and, and I'd love to talk about the right way. If anything. Um, would you like to take the group? But against Bird's famous quote to heart and reflect on it for the fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. And you write very well, so please do keep writing. This is Suresh Kumar from Singapore. I mean, there's so much presumptions on what the right way is. The, Suresh Kumar has his own right way. He's presumed that people are not following me, which is also a presumption that he's most willing to accept. Uh, he, um, I mean, there are multiple audiences in the world. Let's, refle let's remember that. Everybody is not speaking to the same audience and everybody is not expecting all the audience uh, to share your thought. Now, I don't believe there's any one right way to do it. Uh, probably Suresh Kumar's right way comes with an imagination of certain individuals who he believed did it the right way. I may have in my mind a few other individuals who I think they did the right way. There is actually no true right way. Uh, my right way is to disturb you. And if that's the wrong way, I'm sorry, I'm going to continue to disturb you. I'm going to disturb myself. I'm going to disturb you. If, it's, if you think that that makes people more angry, I'm okay with that too. I'm absolutely fine with that. And I think we need to wait. We always need to wait, especially when you're having cultural conversations. We need to wait before it, uh, it moves in its spectrum of being anger to resistance to saying, okay, maybe there's something in it. People will move. And everybody, there are multiple ways in which problems need to be addressed. And each one would find their own way of addressing it, their own way of questioning it. And it's the intersection of all these things that answer. Let me tell you, Gandhi is not the perfect way of asking questions. I want to put that out loudly and clear. We are obsessed with this Gandhian way. Gandhian way is not the perfect way in the world. None, you know, Gandhian way is one way of asking questions out of which there are a lot of things we should learn and treasure. I'm not saying Suresh Kumar said Gandhian way. I'm just using that as because I think we have an obsession with this whole Gandhian way. I think there's many things wrong about the Gandhian way. There are many things discriminative about the Gandhian way as much as there are many things very inclusive about the Gandhian way. So we need, if there was no Ambedkar, there, there, all Gandhi's questions are a waste. So let's remember that it is multiple voices resonating and, in, and reflecting and speaking about multiple issues that finally gives society a way forward, not one right way. Um, Balchand Parayat wants to know, you spoke about Dalit musical instrument makers in Tamil Nadu and Kerala. Does the same problem exist in the North? So yeah, I mean, uh, in general, the making, especially if it involves height, uh, let's also remember that caste transcends religion. It exists in every religion in this country. Um, so if, if, if the making involves height, especially, you do find that the maker comes from marginalized sections. Uh, I'm not, they may not be Dalit, but they'll still be from sections of society that is most certainly not Brahmin. Now in this book, for example, you'll find a couple of Brahmins who actually make the murder. There are more exceptions than uh, the normal happening. So yes, if it involves any work that involves skin in Indian society, usually means that it is being done by people who are on the margins and mostly people who are from the Dalit community. This is pretty much the reality. Um, Joel Dave says, I'm a music educator and I've seen so many people turn to see on pitch, even the right imagination to find it. Um, so he's just agreeing with you. That, uh, I think you agree with your comment about listening uh, as being transformative. Uh, uh, and I know we've taken up an hour of your time. 
I also know that uh, since when we speak about music, it is really hard to let you go without requesting a snatch of song. And the interesting thing amongst the very uh, and interesting quotes is that you do um, most recently a theme on your YouTube channel, the sheer eclecticism of even the last three or four uh, you know recordings that might be there. There's some other Maskalandar. There is Ham uh, Dekhenge. There are, and there's of course the uh, Carnatic uh, pieces. So really something that you would want to pick and give us a snatch of song before we. Go. Just a few lines, and there's a song that most people would know. Mm. Allah Meg De, Allah Meg De, Pani De, Chaya De, De Tu Rama Meg De, Allah Meg De, Allah Meg De, Pani De, Chaya De, De Tu Rama Meg De, Shama Meg De. Allah Meg De Pani De Chaya De Re Tu Rama Meg De Aankhe Phaadhe Dunia Dekhe Aankhe Phaadhe Dunia Dekhe Haaye Tamasha Aankhe Phaadhe Dunia Dekhe Haaye Tamasha Haaye Vishwas Mere Haaye Teri Asha Allah Meg De Pani De Chaya De Re Tu Rama Meg De Shama Meg De Allah Meg De Shama Meg De Rama Meg De Pani De Chaya De Re Tu Rama Meg De Thank you so much. There are no words needed after that. Um, but thank you for, for, as always, your time, your erudition, and your sheer fierce force of conviction. Um, thank you for being here.